ons allemaal het groot geword met lange hoof en hy is eindelijk deel van ons gene en deel van ons wees en baie interessante man, ongelooflik. Uh, so doen nie self moeite of doen bykie moeite en gelees weer op oor lange hoof en, en ook wat hy geskryf het, maar hier is so bykie van, soos die Engelsman sê, een twist. Ons gaan gesels met Dominique Malerbe en Dominique is Engels, is een Engelse Malerbe, so my nou nie denk sy praat Engels en sy is Malerbe nie, sal bykie uitvind ook om sy Engelse Malerbe. En sy het een boek geskryf op soek na Saarkie en uh, Saarkie is een uh, Engelse boek gewees, um, uh, wat Sarah is, en hy het haar Saarkie genoem, maar baie interessant, so, hierdie is baie, 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 baie geïnteresseerd. So, welcome Dominique. Morning, thanks very much. Uh, before we get to the book, I just want to establish you as, as our guest. Uh, you're, you're a tax law expert, and, um, you know, and you've got master's degrees and everything, and then you turn writer. So just give us a little bit of background about yourself and about your, your first book, From Courtrooms to Cupcakes. Okay, um, I, 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 I squirm at the um, description of myself as a tax expert because that was in my last life. Um, but I did start off as a lawyer and I did specialize in tax. Um, but I've moved on quite, uh, quite uh, significantly since then um, with the advent of four children. And that's really been my theme of, of writing is to try and work out how to combine a, a, a career in law with raising children. So that was really the theme of my first two books, um, uh, which I started in 2014. So I've always kind of been on the periphery of, of law. I've never, I've never really stayed in practice. I did specialize in tax and I was more in corporate law, um, but I then moved on to lecturing. I lectured for 10 years in order to just keep that balance with family and, and, and a legal career together. And hence my writing started. And I realized that really I couldn't do this, this uh, full-blown law career. So that's really my background in, in writing. And then I think people will be a bit confused uh, being English, but having a connection with Langenhofen. And I was fascinated by the story. I can't wait to read the book. And I hated to do an interview before reading the book. So I, I was really doing my research about this. And uh, just give us the background about Sarah Goldblatt, because you were looking for, we're going to get to the family connection. Um, but it's so interesting, the, the story and the roles he played in Langenhofen's life. Well, uh, strangely enough, and, and, and this was the one part of the book when I started writing it that I, I didn't really want to bring up was the, was the family connection. But in fact, uh, Sarah, or Saki, as she was really known, was my great aunt. So she is the sister, so was the sister from my opa. And I can actually speak a little bit of Afrikaans, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stick to English now. Perfect. Um, but she, um, she was a fascinating woman. And in fact, it was with the writing of my previous book, I wrote a sequel to, to From Courtrooms, and I was looking at my, at my roots, at my heritage. Um, and I've got quite an interesting family background in law, particularly, and in fact, in, in writing. And uh, I was wondering, if, you know, the, when I was researching my great grandfather, her father, I came across, I mean, not I, I didn't come across it then, I've always known about Sarah, about Sarki. We didn't know her as Sarki, we knew her as Sarah. But I always knew that she was intricately connected with Langenhoven in some way. That was the family rumor for us. So she was my great aunt. Uh, I only actually ever met her once in my life. Um, she died in 1975 and I was not quite 10 years old at that stage. So there was always this feeling that there was a mystery around her and her connection to Langenhoven. And that's really how I started on on researching um, what what it was that she did for Langenhoven and, and really what their relationship was about. And and the connection for people that don't know this history, um, I think in Afrikaans van Saarki verduidelik yeah. het begin werksam met Langenhoven, wat hy redakteer was van het Zuid Westen, a Courant, en hulle yeah. sy toe die redaktie um, aangesluit by hulle van September 1912 tot 1915, maar aan die einde van sy leven het hy sy boekes, die kuratorskop van sy boeken aan haar gelost. That's, that was like a very big thing, and I mean, it kept her busy for the rest of her life. And do you think this relationship started in, in that editorial uh, work? Yes, absolutely. Yes, no, absolutely. That's where it started. And it's very difficult to actually find out exactly why it was that she got there, or how she got to Oatswain, because she was very connected with her father. 
David, who then left under fairly suspicious circumstances off to New York. So they originally arrived from London um, when she was a small, when she was nine years old, and they settled in Cape Town. But he always, her father always wanted to explore the world of, of Yiddish literature, and in fact, he was fairly instrumental in, in in the work that he did in that in that language. So she was schooled in Yiddish, in Yiddish and and, and English, and she spoke German. And she must have, and this is what I speculate somehow, is that through her father's connections, um, she must have met him. I think, I suspect that she must have met Langenhoven when she was quite young, because she sort of upped and left quite quickly under under strange circumstances and went off to Otsuan. As a young girl, she was 21 years old, and she then became the editor with Langenhoven, and the two of them worked at at Het Het Westen until the ostrich feather uh, uh, industry collapsed and and the newspaper was was then closed. But that was the beginning of her relationship with with Langenhoven, mm. and uh, it must have started there. So uh, one then has to try and put together the pieces and establish, you know, what exactly the relationship was like because she then worked with him until he died in 1932, which is a substantial amount of time. You know, it was 20 years that she then looked after his work. Uh, as one of the things that she did. She was, in fact, also a a teacher, and she was quite passionate about uh, teaching, and she had an enormous impact in the Afrikaans world, um, getting Afrikaans to be connected or respected and and recognized as a language of instruction. So apart from the work she did with Langenhoven, she was a a woman in her own right, and um, this was the story that really that I was trying to get to the bottom of. And obviously, Langenhoven was... Was the connection, but it was it was the fascination of of what it was that she did for Longnerven and why she's been buried for so long in terms of the media and really what her role was in his life. Mm. And not just I the, feel like I could carry on. I don't know if I'm answering no, the question. You're but answering the so question. <laughs> yeah, no, we're fascinated so- by the story, and I just want to get a touch on the. I mean, for, for like women rights. If you see pictures of her, uh, she actually. She's, she's surrounded with men in a time that it was very difficult to, to be taken up seriously by men as a woman. Um, and, and, you know, high level, uh, even politics, she was really amazing. She, she, was quite a, she was quite a well-connected woman. I mean, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, the, the catalogue of documents that I worked through, you know, and that was the thing. I wasn't, uh, there is such a, a comprehensive catalogue of people that she met in her life, obviously through the work that she did for him. So whether it was on a parliamentary level or political level or academic level, um, she was very connected and she was quite a forceful woman. I mean, no one's ever spoken of her being a, a soft, gracious woman. She was she was a force to be reckoned with. And, um, and this has been so interesting for me because the family... You know, the family that is still alive of hers, okay, so it's, it's my mother and my mother's sister. Those are the two um, family members of hers that are still alive, and obviously the whole Brummer, Brummer side, which is another interesting part of the story. Um, but everyone that is still alive actually doesn't know what it was that she was doing or what they, or, or in her life, other than what she what she told or you know or, yeah what what came out in the public domain at the time she was she seemed to always want to keep everything that she did under wraps mm. until such time as as she died because there was suddenly this catalog and the, this enormous comprehensive um, wealth of, of of documentation there just ready to be explored and it just mm. it felt like it was already waiting waiting sure. for the story to come up Great. Nikki, I'm going to stop you there, but we're going to chat after seven, <clears throat> seven, uh, because I really yeah. want to find out um, if there was love and maybe a child. So we're going to get there. So as you have won it, of long and often, Frauke is a Frau in Sarki from Kar Gevet het, and miskien was daar a kind, moet jy in geskakel blijf. Ons praat vir oogend oor Sarah. In Sarah, in Afrikaans, beter bekend, dat het as Sarki genoem, as jy... Um, in Engels die boek wil koop, is Searching for Sarah, geskryf door Dominique Malerbe, um, en het is baie interessant, maar oor, sê jy, Langenhoven, op soek na Saarkie, hy is nou in Afrikaans beskikbaar, hierdie boek wil jy lees. So, Dominique, welcome back. Thanks so much. <laughs> Super to be here. So, we, we gave a little bit of background about Sarah, but the, the biggest work about uh, Langenhoven was done by, by uh, J.C. Kahnemeyer, of J.C. Kahnemeyer, um, and 
was his work, did it help you or was it a bit of a frustration? Oh, um, it was a bit of both actually because, well, first of all, all my sources were in Afrikaans. So even though I can read Afrikaans and I can speak a little bit, although I'm not really doing much yet, um, that was a little bit of an obstacle purely because it was such a comprehensive piece of work. It was a, a real thick tomb of, 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 of information. So, but it also gave me all the, the reference points um, and, and, and it gave me a, a, the thread of the story. So it was with Kanamea that I had to begin. It was, almost, it was imperative that I start with, his, with, with that uh, biography because in fact, Sarah appears on the, on the fourth page and she, she dominates the first part of the biography in order almost to dismiss her, to, to mention her, but then sort of the whole way through, it appears that, she, that he's, he tries to sort of negate the influence that she had over him in some ways. Mm. In a yeah, so it was both. So it was both. So I need to for the background. Now, the long one of his wife was 10 years old, and she was a woman. And Sarki was the work colleague that was actually more than just a work situation. But very interesting, she had one daughter in England. And she told, she, um, it, it was long one of his daughters, she told her son, Dr. Uh, Guillaume Brummer, a story about a kitchen or something in a kitchen. Um, and there, there was, there was a, 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 a little seed planted. Well, Excuse I think, the I, I think, yeah, there must have been there must have been other incidences apart from those mentioned in the book. But Kaname alludes to a a conversation that that um, Aguila and Bruma overheard between Engela and Froki, and the and and it it was obvious that that there had been discussion of Sarah, and the conversation was, well, how do you how do you tolerate this? She, apparently, that uh, um, it was um, Froki that had come across the two of them in 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 what Gilam's wife describes as a compromising position. And, but th there must have been more than that, and obviously on more occasions. But what kind of alludes to is a conversation um, that uh, Engela and, and uh, Froki must have had. And Engela was incensed by this. You know, she sort of couldn't understand why her mother, Froki, uh, why her mother would tolerate um, this relationship with Sarah. And, and her answer seemed simply that, she was in love with him, but of course, that that whole relationship between Engela and Froki is is a, um, a very interesting one. As as was rather the, the the relationship with both Sarah and Engela and Sarah and Froki, and it was those relationships that I also needed to explore to find out how they all sort of hung together, as it were. It it, it was a really fascinating um, exploration for me. Yeah. And then the big question then. Um, do you think, and, and, and we're going to uh, talk about the Brummers, what they're saying as well, and family members, do you think there was a love child? Well, uh, the, the evidence certainly points to that, and from both sides of the family. So my, my first inclination, and, and throughout my research and, and the writing of the story, I've kept going back. Because as I said, from our side, there is only my mother and my mother's sister. My mother's sister lives in Israel and she she's in her 90s and it's difficult to really get any more information. Uh, but, but all that they will tell you that there was a child. Without doubt, there was a child. And, and, and I think uh, we're, we're all so sad that my aunt, my, um, my mother's sister, Naomi, who died, uh, what did we say, four years ago now, I think in May, she would have known the whole story. But no one ever asked her at the time. And all we know is that there was a child. So that's all we had to go on. There was nothing else to go on apart from that. And then uh, the Brummers, obviously, you know, I've, I've been in discussion with them too, and I interviewed them, and... They also made mention of a child, um, so it's not something that um, you know. Is this is not a surprise, really? Um, it's just trying to find the child, which was another part of the story. Sure, if you can guess, how old do you think that child will be today, if he's still alive? Well, uh, well, the idea is that the child was born in 1925, so in all, in all likelihood. That child is, you know, would be in their 90s, 95 at the time I was writing, which was now a year ago. Yeah, um, and and I've made I made some inroads there, 
and um, I'll leave it at that. Hmm. I'll leave it at that. But, but, but yeah. No, because we still want people to read this book. We don't want to give away too much. Um, it's so beautiful when when uh, Sarki and Sa or Sarah uh, lived at one stage in Marlborough in Cape Town. She called her house um, Lulu Rai, and and the way she fell in love with Afrikaans as well. And like it's very clear, long and often. Do you think there's a universal story? Um, because he's such a big figure. Uh, and, and, and love triangles and uh, relationship, like Froki said, she knows what she's giving him and she understands that they're connecting on an intellectual level. Um, that even that reading the book can mean something to people because it's a universal thing that's been going on for uh, since the, the, the beginning of time. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's such an interesting... I mean, I'm fascinated, first of all, with human relationships as a start. You know, the value of women and... And how they relate to each other and, and, and what relationships bring to each other. Um, you know, the whole idea of, of monogamy actually is quite an interesting one because one one doesn't always, you know, you, you know, it's difficult to get everything from, from one person. Um, and and I suppose, you know, in their case, so Langenhoven, I mean, Frankie was 10 years older than 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 Langenhoven was. And she she'd had a whole life. You know, she was widowed, she had her own children. Um she gave him a different kind of comfort. And, and Sarah for Langenhoven was the intellectual stimulus. And obviously she was young um, and they worked together. And, and you know, you'll have to read what, what is said about the, intellect, the, the intellectual um, stimulation and how that creates a more intimate side of, of a relationship very often. Um, but going to your back, to your, your, you started off by talking about her home and Lulurai and... Um, I mean, the signs are, are, are all there if you read the story about how much of Langenhoven she she embraced in her life. I mean, from, from everything. Her cars, her car was called Heri. Um, her house was called Lulurai. It was all about Langenhoven. It was, she was absolutely devoted to him, but she could mm. never have him because he was, he was married to somebody else. He had another whole life. Mm. So in some ways, it's a, it's a very tragic story. Um, and and you know it, it's such a it's such a fascinating as I said a mix mm. of <clears throat> so many things. It's the relationship between the Afrikaners and the Jews. It's a, it's a, it's a story about language of of um, you know Afrikaans for me has suddenly become a you know almost I've sort of discovered a whole new love of the language. Mm. Um, so it, it's on and obviously it's a woman's story and and women's stories are, are imperative. You know we need to. We are. We are getting there. We're getting mm. there with women's stories and their contributions to the world. But you know, not enough. This is not this enough. is one yes. of this is this is one of another another one of these stories. And they're Great. all starting to emerge. Yes. Nikki, I have to stop you there. We're out of time. I'll motivate people to get the book. Thank you so much. I myself can't wait to read it. Thanks for your time. Thank you for thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a film and here book. Almost